Hello fellow polymaths, this is the Great Everything, a free upgrade package for your moral and intellectual software. I'm Patrick, a former banking lawyer who saw the light and quit to dedicate my life to culture and philosophy. Today is the anniversary of the birth of perhaps one of the greatest geniuses who ever lived. A genius is a word that gets overused, I think. We call pretty much anyone with skills or anything we like genius. You know, Kanye is a genius. Or have you tried Franklin's barbecue? It's genius. Except there are times we use the word and we really, really mean it. And there's a few candidates that immediately spring to mind. You know, you have the scientific genius par excellence. That's uh, Albert Einstein. Maybe Isaac Newton. And then you've got genius inventors like Tesla and Edison. And in the arts, you have people like Mozart, who really represent uh, what we mean when we say genius. But the guy I'm talking about today, the guy whose birthday it is, he's special. Because he's not a scientific genius. He's not a mad inventor. And he's not a visionary artist. He's something different. He's all these things rolled into one. I'm talking, of course, of Leonardo da Vinci, who was born today in 1452. Who was Leonardo? Please, by the way, call him Leonardo and not just Da Vinci. Da Vinci just means from Vinci. It's where he's from. It's not his surname. So calling him Da Vinci would be like calling Catherine of Aragon just of Aragon. It would make sense. Leonardo was the kind of person who, I guess he sounds like a made-up character in a novel. He's incredibly intelligent, obviously, artistically talented, charming and charismatic, but also tall and by all descriptions, almost absurdly beautiful, and with the body of a Greek god. <laughs> yeah, Leonardo was ripped. The credible conjecture is that his uh, famous sketch, The Vitruvian Man, you know the one that is that angry looking guy with his arms stretched out, um, and it's meant to represent the perfect male proportions. And the theory is that it's actually based on his own uh, attributes. And his biographers note that Leonardo could perform amazing feats of strength, like bending an iron bar with his bare hands. So far, so good, right? He sounds almost perfect, but not necessarily interesting. We rarely find perfection interesting. But he was different in that sense, too, because he wasn't just quote-unquote perfect. There was also a weirdness about Leonardo. You know, sometimes I like to play this game, where I compare famous people to other greats, but in different fields. And it's a way to understand how these people relate to each other, what they represent, what archetype they inhabit, what, um, if it were a movie about them, what role they would be playing. So, as an example, Raffaello is the elegant dandy, the prince of the arts, as he was known. He was creating his works with ease, producing great masterpieces, like it was just nothing. It reminds me of Mozart. And then you have Michelangelo, the tortured artist, dirty, disheveled, sweaty, engaged in a titanic struggle to express his furious passion. He's like Beethoven in that sense. But Leonardo, he's the mystic, he's the sorcerer. He's somewhere between our world and another. And maybe that's my theme with Leonardo, the way I view him, as being between worlds. He was born out of wedlock. He was the son of a wealthy notary and a poor peasant. So in that sense, also between worlds, essentially a bastard like Jon Snow. He was unschooled at a time of remarkable intellectual flourishing. This is Florence during the Renaissance, so you can imagine the vibrant artistic and intellectual life he was exposed to. And he was gay in a world that was Catholic. He was left-handed in a world that saw that as a sign of the devil. You know, the word sinister, that's actually Latin for left. And he was, by talents and also by approach to life, both a scientist and an artist. And some would call these two ways of looking at the world almost incompatible. So you see what I mean? This is a man who both straddles different worlds, but is also between them at the same time, somewhere in the cracks. And maybe it's this rootlessness of being neither fully here nor there, neither fully this nor that, that may have contributed to a deep intellectual restlessness, an inability to just settle on one thing, and a constant need to find new things to focus his considerable intellect on. And that's maybe the most important thing to understand about Leonardo, that he's kind of like the holy trinity in Catholic doctrine, uno e trino, trino e uno, at the same time one thing and three separate distinct things, father, son, 
and Holy Spirit, and at the same time, the one thing that unites them all, God. And Leonardo is kind of like that, because it's true to say that there are three Leonardos, the scientist, the engineer, the inventor, and the artist. But at the same time, there is one Leonardo, the one who unites these different attitudes in a way where each skill feeds into and enhances, but also draws upon the other. Leonardo the polymath. Leonardo the quintessential Renaissance man. Leonardo the universal genius who happened to be an artist. Can you dig it? I ain't embarrassed to use the word. Can you dig it? I'm talking about ethics. Can you dig it? Damn it, Patrick! You silver tongue. Perhaps the greatest Leonardo is Leonardo the Inventor. As a young boy, he began an apprenticeship in the workshop of a great artist of the High Renaissance, Verrocchio. And in that workshop, Leonardo learned the rudiments of painting. But not just that. His employer, see, worked for the Medici family, the ruling family of Florence at the time. And for them, he undertook a great number of public works, like the two-ton copper globe that was hoisted on top of Florence's famous dome by Brunelleschi. Imagine what this meant. You had to create a two-ton globe out of copper, and then you had to hoist it on top of a dome. So this kind of work doesn't require artistic prowess as much as mechanical and engineering skills. So from the earliest age, Leonardo's talents were put to use in diverse fields. Mechanics, engineering, painting, the work, sculpture. As Leonardo himself wrote in his notebooks, the artist must develop all his skills, as there is no honor in doing one thing well and the others badly. Mechanical engineering was one of Leonardo's greatest passions, and arguably his greatest talent too. Today we can leaf through the uh, reproductions of his notebooks with that trademark spidery script, you know, written right to left and backwards, so that you actually need a mirror to read it. And, I mean, just how weird is he, by the way? And these notebooks, they're filled with thousands and thousands of pages of sketches and drawings and theories about buildings and fortifications and weapons and various fantastical devices and contraptions that could belong in a Jules Verne novel. They're unbelievably ahead of his time. Think of the armored car. The precursor to our tank was designed to intimidate enemy forces, it moved on wheels operated by cranks, it had protective armor just like ours, metal plate reinforcements to deflect enemy fire, it had a circular turret that could turn 360 degrees and fire at enemies all around, and 500 years later someone had a similar idea and here we are, tanks. Then of course there's the Ornithopter, his famous flying machine, perhaps his most famous invention. It was inspired by the flight of birds and bats that he was fascinated with. And guess what? It works. I mean, it can't generate the power to lift you off the ground, but if you launch it from a height, like a gliding machine, you'll fly. Although, of course, I do not endorse such amateur experimentation that is undertook without expert guidance and advice. Similar to the ornithopter, there's his uh, air screw, the predecessor to the modern helicopter. And what about the parachute? You know, 300 years before the parachute was actually invented, Leonardo designed a triangular parachute that was tried in the year 2000. And not only did it work, but the guy who tried it said it offered a smoother experience than traditional parachutes. And if you're more into swimming than flying, don't worry, Lenny's got you covered. He designed scuba gear for underwater attacks on enemy ships. So his gear has got a mask that attaches to tubes, and the other end of the tube is attached to big corks that float up on the surface, and that's how you get your air. It had a balloon the diver could operate and inflate or deflate, and that would help you sink or go back to the surface. And the suit even had a pouch in the front to pee in. As Tommy Wiseau says in the room, ha <laughs> you think about everything. And then you have the Robot Knight, a suit of armor filled with clockwork, you know, pulleys and gears to give it independent motion. And then there's all the big weapons, you know, the triple-barreled cannon, the giant crossbow that's kind of like the one Bronn uses in Game of Thrones to try and kill the dragon. And that's a theme with Leonardo, especially with the weaponry. It's all big. It's taking these pre-existing inventions and pushing them past their limits in design and in scale. It's just breathtaking, the breath of his imagination. 
And what's almost as striking as the forward thinking displayed in his notebooks and how many of these devices actually work when tried today, what's almost as surprising as that is how few of these he was able or willing to actually make and put into practice. Now, of course, for many of these, it wasn't really his fault. He would have needed massive financial backing. Think how expensive it would have been to make some of these big war machines. But nonetheless, there's a sense that it was his intellectual restlessness, this, um, this constant need to move on, that stopped him from bringing his projects to completion. That once he'd figured out how it would work, that was enough. That was what he really cared about. As he wrote, to conceive an idea is noble. To execute the work is servile. Perhaps the greatest Leonardo is Leonardo the scientist. Some see Leonardo as the father of the scientific revolution, that um, massive shift in attitude from blindly accepting church dogma about how the world works to an approach of individual investigation of nature and its mysteries, to questioning everything. And this was a shift that led to an explosion in our ability to rapidly accumulate knowledge and that ramped up the speed on human progress. Now, seeing Leonardo as the beginner of all this might be a slight exaggeration, but not by much. Because before the official fathers of that revolution, Galileo, Francis Bacon, Copernicus, Leonardo was doing something that looks very similar to modern science. So this is the Renaissance scene. And just a while earlier, in the 1300s, ancient Greek and Roman philosophy and literature had just been rediscovered. And so the worldview was shifting away from medieval theology towards a vision based on ancient thought. But in a way, our understanding of the world and the laws of nature was simply moving away from one dogma, the dogma of the church, this is how the world works because the Bible says so, to a different dogma, this is how the world works because Aristotle says so. But Leonardo, he wasn't one to blindly accept any dogma, that of the church or of the great minds of the ancient world. And it's not that he just wouldn't accept their authority, he also wouldn't accept their method of understanding the world. He wouldn't just sit in his armchair and theorize deductively about the universe like the medieval philosophers before him used to do. No, he wanted to verify theories through observing nature and then take those observations and reason on those. This is pretty much the inductive approach to gathering knowledge. Quote, First, I shall do some experiments before I proceed further because my intention is to consult experience first and then, with reasoning, show why such experience is bound to operate in such a way. This is the scientific method, 150 years before the scientific method. As he used to say, knowledge is the daughter of experience. That's empiricism, centuries before Francis Bacon. So just like Galileo and Copernicus and Newton after them, Leonardo saw observation as the key to knowledge, and he was the keenest of observers. Because remember, Leonardo was an artist, with an eye trained to capture nature, to capture the outlines, to notice the smallest details, the subtlest shifts and movements, the play of light, the interaction between an object and its surroundings. And he rigorously recorded all of this and sketches in his notebooks. And what was it that Leonardo saw with this keen eye of his? He saw the world as a living being in constant motion. See, Leonardo, he understood the human body like perhaps no man ever had before him. He conducted autopsies, drawing everything he saw, making casts and models to see how the individual organs would work and how they depended on one another. His theories on the heart, by the way, and its valves, it was centuries ahead of his time. He was the first to write about how arteries work, how they become brittle and clogged over time. 500 years before the rest of us, he diagnosed arteriosclerosis. And maybe that understanding of the body influenced his scientific worldview. That's the thing. Leonardo saw the whole world as an organism, 
dynamic, constantly in movement, all interconnected, every part dependent on every other. And you can see this kind of dynamism of everything touching everything else in his sketches of the movement of air, which he used to devise his flying machines, of course. And take a look at his drawings on water, Google them. You will note the detail with which he captures each little vortex and how each of those interplays with all the others. And then, by the way, look at his paintings and how he paints human hair. A great example of this is the hair of his angel in Verrocchio's The Baptism of Christ. The painting is by his mentor, but Leonardo painted the angel to the left. And in the hair, you'll see the same flow, the same movement you see in the water sketches, the same fluidity. And that's nature to Leonardo, a fluid living creature in constant flux, always evolving, filled with hidden patterns and numbers there to be explored and discovered. Everything in nature is connected. So yes, obviously, Leonardo was a vegetarian. As he said, he didn't want his body to be the tomb for any other creature. When you think of the man's accomplishments, the depth of his grasp of nature's workings and interconnectedness, the accuracy of so many of his ideas, and above all, the remarkable progressivism of his empirical method. It's hard to believe that Leonardo was just completely unschooled. No formal education in literature or Aristotelian science, you know, what back then was known as natural philosophy. He did it all by himself. And maybe that's part of the reason behind his genius. He was not constricted, limited by ancient theories and conservative patterns of thought. He was free. He was free to see the world with eyes completely untainted by that formal training. After all, why defer to teachers when you could be, as Leonardo referred to himself, discepolo della esperienza, a disciple of experience? <laughs> Perhaps the greatest Leonardo is Leonardo the artist. After all, that's the guy who millions of people line up to pay tribute to in the Louvre every year. I mean, Mona Lisa is by far the most visited and well-known painting of all time. I mean, nothing comes close. Not Michelangelo's David, not the Sistine Chapel, nothing by Rembrandt or Velázquez, not even Picasso or Van Gogh, nobody. And just last year, his Salvatore Mundi, the, the portrait of Christ, it was sold for 450 million US dollars, the all-time record for any painting ever. It's pretty amazing when you think of the fact that Leonardo didn't even see himself as an artist. So at one point, he was looking for a job with the very powerful Sforza family in Milan. And so he sent them a letter that reads kind of like a CV. And he's pitching himself as an engineer, mainly. So it gives a list of all the things he's good at, 10 skills that he's mastered. And these are bridges, siege equipment, besieging uphill, cannons, tunneling under fortifications, covering to protect infantry, different types of bigger cannons, catapults, warships, architecture and canals. And then as a postscript, he says, oh yeah, also I can paint. So basically he sees himself as an engineer who also happens to dabble in painting. And then you think of his accomplishments in painting, like Mona Lisa, the, the, the Last Supper, he is just remarkable. Now what makes the artist Leonardo so special? To discuss this, I brought in my friend Simone, an architect with a very deep knowledge in the history of art and architecture. I asked him to give his perspective on Leonardo's influence as an artist. Hello, Patrick. So. Regarding Leonardo, I think what we always discussed together uh, is that it's a very difficult personality to really find a slot or to label, to make like a simplification of his complexity and about how dense it's been his career and his uh, like scope of studies. It's really, really um, a big task to, to make a, a actually representative description of why he's so relevant and how he contributed to the evolution and to the radical changes of uh, visual arts and also for other, for other arts like sculpture and architecture. And I think the, the point is his approach to geometry. His approach to geometry and the way he represents life, reality, people, elements in his paintings, it's really far away from the traditional way in which other Renaissance artists, they were producing their works at that time. Uh, the geometry he used uh, in his painting 
is not anymore a rigid geometry. For example, if we want to, to put together two like very clear examples, you can put the, the Virgin of the Rocks, the famous painting that Leonardo uh, painted twice. One version is in Louvre, another version is in the National Gallery in London. And for example, uh, Christ's flagellation of Piero della Francesca. These two paintings, of course, they are not, not really close by time-wise, but they are good examples of these two different strategies of geometrical representation. Before Leonardo, the central perspective view was the main instrument to represent reality. The Renaissance people, Piero della Francesca, but also Leon Battista Alberti, they believed that central perspective view was the point of view of putting human being back in the center of your attention. Uh, but what Leonardo uh, find out through time is that there's no really uh, a central perspective point of view. He just realized that the human condition is not a rigid and geometry condition. The feelings, the spirit, uh, they can't be like uh, uh, framed in that way. And also that the, fe the feelings of the human being and the personality of human beings, they are not perfect. So you can't really represent uh, life in a perfect way. So uh, what Leonardo do is like uh, putting his figures in the position of breaking free from this rigid schematic grid that was the underpinning of previous artist uh, structure. And his figures, they just occupy the space in a much more free way. They come out from the canvas. They, they, they really live in the space with you when you look at some of these examples of Leonardo's paintings. So uh, I think this humanization of the visual arts that, that Leonardo start, it's really uh, a revolution. And that will influence also architects like Donato Bramante, the famous architect that started the project of uh, St. Peter Cathedral in Rome. In, in his way of doing architecture, again, as Leonardo, the elements that he used, like columns, like arches, like pediments, they are not any more rigid, static, perfect, uh, diagrammatic. They start really living. You can really see how the columns, they support like loads and stressed. They, they expand, they occupy the space. They create shadows. Uh, there are dark spots and spots in light in a much more uh, dramatic way. So architecture became drama, became like Leonardo's painting, it became real. So Leonardo's innovation is the less rigid, freer way that figures inhabit space. And this move towards naturalism, it's hard not to see it as being influenced by his worldview as a scientist, his vision of the interconnectedness of nature, of everything flowing into everything else. Look at previous Renaissance artists, and you'll see these clear outlines, you know, with objects heavily delineated. Their edges are almost like barriers between the objects and the space around those objects. Now look at Leonardo's human figures, like his portrait of Ginevra de Benci. You'll recognize it. It's a, it's a portrait of a noble woman looking very much like a hungover Meryl Streep. And you'll see that the edges are blurred. There's a smoky quality to everything with no clear outlines. Everything just sort of blending into the surroundings. And it's hard to see where one thing begins and another ends. This technique, which he pioneered, is known as sfumato, which literally means like smoke. And this sfumatura, this smokiness, this melting of the figures into their background, it gives those figures a mysterious, almost ghost-like quality both human, but also more than human. Like Leonardo himself, his figures inhabit a space between worlds. And to me, it's this sense of mystery, almost like dark magic, that sets Leonardo apart from his great contemporaries. You can see in his early works, like The Adoration of the Magi, a, an incomplete work that kind of uh, points forward towards uh, Raffaello's Transfiguration and Michelangelo's Last Judgment. So in the painting, you have Jesus and Mary looking serene and gentle, but they're surrounded by a scene of chaos. The adoring expressions of those present is almost like a caricature. It's an ecstasy that is kind of grotesque. This is not a gentle scene that, you know, we kind of associate with Christmas, but a wild frenzy. It feels more like an apocalypse than a virgin birth. 
And this dark mystery is constant in Leonardo's eerie landscapes, you know, the famously ominous background to the Mona Lisa and the harsh, craggy rocks in the Virgin on the rocks. Nature in Leonardo's paintings, it always feels foreboding, like something, something's on the verge of happening. Kind of like when the sky turns that greenish hue before a tornado. But never is this weird, magical quality so present as with his human portraits. So Michelangelo, he draws men as men, powerful, proud, no longer cowering in the shadow of God, but great precisely because they are human. Raffaello's figures are gentle and elegant, aspiring to a higher ideal of perfection and grace. But Leonardo's figures have an uncanny mysticism about them, an eerie and almost supernatural power, like something of their living souls was captured in the canvas. My favorite example of this is that Salvator Mundi, the portrait of Christ I mentioned earlier, the, the, the one that sold for a record price. Google it now. Find a high-res image and then do me a favor. Focus on the face, on the expression. And if you can, and I recommend you find a way to do this, zoom in on Christ's eyes. Those eyes, they are, they're magnetic. They transfix you with a power, with a force that is almost alien. It's beyond human. These are the eyes of a god. It's deeply uncomfortable, but also awe-inspiring. Or consider the softer expression of La Donna con l'Ermellino, the lady with her ermine, looking off to the right. And everything from her pose to her gaze to the extraordinary expression of the animal she's holding. By the way, look at how beautifully rendered the hand she's holding it with is. Everything about this whole painting says this woman is not posing for a portrait. She is seeing something out of our sight and she's processing it in a way that we can never understand. What is she looking at? What is she thinking? It's a living moment shrouded in mystery. Just like that expression in his most famous work, the Mona Lisa. Perhaps too much has been said about this work. I mean, who was it? Is it a man? Is it Leonardo himself? What's she smiling about? Is that even a smile? You come to expect so much from the most famous artwork of all time. It's easy to look it up, see it, and then just not get it. But maybe, Here's a way in. Forget the smile. Focus on the eyes. The complexity, the humanity of her expression. The way she looks at you and sees something, just like the eyes of the Salvator Mundi. It feels alive, like a soul was captured and locked there. And as she figures there, kind of blending into the surroundings, that smoky quality, again, it's easy to feel as though you're seeing something both incredibly human and also not quite human. Again, like so much about Leonardo, his figures are somewhere between worlds. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Leonardo is an almost absurdly complex personality. He's a scientist, an engineer, an artist, and a universal polymath, the ultimate Renaissance man. It's this aspect of Leonardo that fascinates me most. Today, we live in an age of specialization. Adam Smith's conception of the capitalist model, it relies in great part on economies of scale, which in turn relies on hyper-specialization. Each of us focuses on doing one thing and getting really, really good and really fast at doing that one thing. You know, the famous spend 10,000 hours on that thing to become an expert model. But something about this way of doing things, it feels unnatural. Humans are natural polymaths. We thrive when we have the opportunity to branch out and engage with a variety of different things and build connections between all the diverse experiences we are exposed to. The historian Yuval Harari, he makes a very interesting point in his book Sapiens. Imagine our ancestors, you know, the foragers, and imagine the kind of things they had to know the quantity of things they had to know. They had to know how their environment worked, 
where things were. They had to know how to hunt, how to make tools to hunt, how to track animals. They had to recognize what fruits and plants were edible and which shrooms were dangerous and would poison you. They needed hand-eye coordination. They needed to know how to start fires and fix clothes. They needed to know rudimentary medicine. There was no division of labor. Everyone needed to be able to survive and to do everything for everyone else. And that meant knowing a lot and in different areas. And we see this in ancient intellectuals too, you know, millennia after the foragers. Before the Renaissance, there was no formal division of disciplines, you know, like I'm a philosopher, I'm a scientist, oh, I'm a psychologist. What kind of psychologist? Oh, I'm a social psychologist. Oh, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm a revolutionary psychologist, etc., etc., etc. Back then, they were just great thinkers. And Leonardo was one of them. He was an inventor whose prophetic designs for machinery and contraptions put him centuries ahead of his time. He was a scientist whose approach to understanding the world made him perhaps the greatest precursor to the scientific revolution. And he's the most famous artist who ever lived. This extreme polymathy makes him someone who it's hard not to see as larger than life. He's miles beyond that old cliche about being a jack of all trades and a master of none. Now, think about that saying for a second, jack of all trades. It kind of sounds like an insult. And it's coming from a worldview where you need to specialize. You need to aim at mastery. Being a master, that's good. That saying is presenting you with a choice. You can either be a jack of all trades or you can be a master of one trade. And it's clear which one is meant to be the better option. Now, what do you want to be? You want to be a master or just some jack? But then someone like Leonardo comes along and he shows us that no, that some people can try to be masters of all trades. And that speaks to the polymath in all of us. Now, there's a downside to this. When you're the kind of person who's driven by a kind of insatiable curiosity about everything, it's easy to just jump from idea to idea, from project to project, excited by the possibilities and the potential and the sheer novelty of whatever new thought just tickled you. And maybe, well, I say maybe, but I should say often, your older projects lose some of that attractive sheen. So you start procrastinating, you get distracted by the new thing. And in the end, maybe you just abandon the previous thing, you leave it unfinished. And that's what Leonardo did, you know. So many of his inventions, he never put them in practice. He never published his notebooks. So he could have been the father of the scientific revolution, but instead he was just rediscovered later. And his artworks, well, 15 or so of them were actually finished. That was maybe his greatest flaw, that he completed so little of what he set out to do. But despite this flaw, to anyone with broad interests, there's something irresistible about his intellectual life. Because sure, there's definitely something cool about a life dedicated to just patiently acquiring mastery in one field. But what could be more enriching, more exciting, more human than rejecting narrow expertise and living wide, living broad. A life of constant exploration, restlessly moving on from discovery to discovery. And it's that aspect of Leonardo that most captivates me. And maybe it's the aspect we can learn the most from. Because we don't all have some special artistic talent, let alone many different talents. But we do all possess that natural human genius for discovery. We all have a tendency to branch out and learn new things, find new connections, to more fully explore the different aspects in this interconnected world we inhabit, this universe of constant flux that Leonardo theorized and painted about. We have that in us. It's natural to us. We can read a book on a subject we know nothing about. We listen to music by a great artist we never got into. We can start a cooking course. We can learn a new language. We can pick up an instrument. Today, with the materials at our disposal, we can enrich our lives by engaging in a diversity of knowledge and experiences that would have left even the original Renaissance men absolutely staggered. It's not that we have the potential to be polymaths. That's who we naturally are. So today, let us think of ways to do that, to unleash our inner polymath, and in doing so, to honor Leonardo da Vinci, the universal genius who happened to be an artist.
Ladies, gentlemen, thank you for listening to today's episode of The Great Everything, and I hope you enjoyed it. Now, if you want to be a part of the conversation, there's a few different ways you can do that. If you're listening on Anchor, you can call in and we can have conversations. You can ask questions and I'll be happy to include your call and your questions on the next episode and we can discuss live. Or you can join the Facebook group, The Great Everything. It's a link to The Great Everything on Facebook. And it's just a group of a few friends and we have discussions about, well, literally everything, as long as we do so respectfully and in a way that is interesting and stimulates conversation. That's what we're all about, interesting conversations. So if you want to be a part of those conversations, please check out The Great Everything, the group on uh, Facebook. If you like what I do here, please help out. And the best way you can do that, that is also free of charge to you, is by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever else it is you listen to The Great Everything. If you're listening on a platform where you can leave a review, please do that. It is very, very helpful and I'd be extremely grateful. Also, consider adding me on social media. There's the usual places, Twitter, Instagram, etc, etc. But you can find all these handles grouped together on the blog thegreateverything.com, where you'll also find interesting articles by myself and my friend Mark, with whom I started the blog. I hope you enjoyed everything and you continue to do so in the future. I am sure I will as well. Arrivederci. podcast you just heard was recorded with anchor if you want to make your own download the android or ios app completely free from anchor.fm slash podcast that's anchor.fm slash podcast